six. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press one. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four one one. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers?、Uh, no, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila.、Um, we'll have the plain white, please.、Uh, but the ones with the little windows. Okay. One box A4 white. Just the one box, was it? Um. On second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets to the pack. Right. Let's see.、Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So, can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to their conversation, and answer questions eight to ten. Anything else that we can help you with? Um,、uh, let me think. What else do we need? Ah,、uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right, floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. Okay, can you include a wall calendar then、uh, with the other stuff?、Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And、um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after eleven thirty a.m. because I have to go out at twelve? There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine, I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past eleven. Thanks very much. Thanks.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Zoe goes to talk to her academic advisor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet?、Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy, and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet. But I really love the campus, and I've already made a few friends. Fantastic. Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester, and assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take Principles of Marketing or Introduction to International Trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right. Well, marketing is a broad, general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career, and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure, you could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing. Introduction to economics, banking, and finance, and let's see, principles of financial accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's okay, I think. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. But I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes, but nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our maths syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and stuff. Hardly any stats. Right. Well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident. Thanks. Hang on a minute. There's one more thing. Your English. Now you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah. Now I'm in an English-speaking environment, and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly to get the information and ideas you need to write your essays. 
That means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material if you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover. That's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. Sometimes these will be from a transparency because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever. At least three hundred and fifty thousand words. Even Winston Churchill only knew sixty thousand, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the academic word list by Avril Coxhead, of Victoria University. That's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied word lists, of course. But how does this one help? The academic word list is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. It contains five hundred and seventy families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. Well. That's apart from the two thousand most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms of a word are listed together, so you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes, and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words. So it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. You can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway. As I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment, take a sheet of paper and write four headings: words I can use, words I can recognise but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a conversation among two students and their tutor about the presentation they are going to make at the tutorial class. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Right, Jason and Karen,、uh, how are your presentations for the next tutorial class? Um, I feel a bit nervous. I haven't done that before. Although many of my classmates in the same tutorial group have finished theirs, but I think them a little uninteresting because they just read out their notes. I hope mine will be more attractive. It seems and... you have a higher demand for yourself. As for me, I have no sense of uneasiness because I made one last semester, 
but I feel no sense of satisfaction about it. It lacked strong arguments, I think. How much did you get for the last presentation, Jason? Eighty-three percent, actually, but my goal for the next one is over eighty-seven percent. It's pretty good. What is your topic for this one? Uh, strategies for reading. I feel my biggest problem is in the reading speed, rather than vocabulary, which is most students' problem, though. I am slow, especially in reading articles on my f major courses. They are complex and dull. Have you found any effective methods? Well, I am not quite sure. I suppose to skim the books or articles is a good approach. Yes, by skimming the book first, you get the choicest parts. It saves a lot of time. You don't have to read every word of the passage, but you have to learn to read certain parts intensively. Yes, I include that in my presentation. There is one thing I'm not clear yet. Why don't we make presentations more related to our major? Once you learn to write clearly, read analytically, and listen to lectures effectively, you'll begin professional tutorials. That means you should start from the basics. Well, Karen, how is your presentation? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Oh, Karen, how is your presentation? I am still in a panic. I want to find some more interesting topics about writing, but I wonder what articles I can refer to, because there are so many of them. Did you get the list of the reading materials handed out last class? Yes, but there are over 20 on it. I have only a week to prepare, so I wonder if okay. you could... Okay, let me give you some suggestions. You needn't read them all, because some of them deal with the same issue. The article by Hallsworth is really worth reading. It covers the aspects of organising the thoughts and ideas. OK, Hallsworth. You should also read the article by Jackson. But just look at the part on research methodology, now how they did it. Right, I'll read that one. You should also read the article by Fisher, but just look at the part on the writing plan. That is, how to plan your writing in a systematical way. OK, Fisher, got that. Um, and if you have time, the one by Risewell says very relevant things. It teaches how to title your articles and make it appealing. You should finish the whole book. OK. Now, the one by Burns, if I were you, I wouldn't bother with the whole passage. Just read the conclusion, which summarises the use of rhetoric. Oh, now I understand. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about the pitfalls and pleasures of being a postgraduate student. Look at questions 32 to 37. Postgraduates are about as easy to define as catching steam in a bucket. Courses can be vocational, for training, 
as research, as a preparation for research, or a combination of these. Also, you can choose between full-time and part-time. Increasingly, the approach to postgraduate study is becoming modular. The vast majority of postgraduates are doing short, taught courses, many of which provide specific vocational training. Indeed, there has been a 400% increase in postgraduate numbers in Britain over the past 20 years. Current figures stand at just under 400,000. People undertake postgraduate study for many reasons. These may be academic, intellectual challenge, development of knowledge, vocational, training for a specific career goal, or only vague, drifting into further study. It is essential that you determine the reasons you want to become a postgraduate. If you have clear goals and reasons for studying, this will enhance your learning experience and help you to remain focused and motivated throughout your course. Where you study should be based on much more than the course you want to do. For some courses, you're likely to be there for several years, and it is important that you are happy living there. Check also what type of accommodation is available, and whether the institution provides any housing specifically for postgraduates. Choosing an institution and department is a difficult process. To determine quality, do not rely on the reputation of an institution, but find out what the ratings are from the most recent assessment exercises. Find out about the staff, their reputation, competence, enthusiasm and friendliness. Visit the department if possible and talk to existing postgraduates about their experience, satisfaction, comments and complaints. Be very careful to check how they feel about their supervisors. Also, check what facilities are available both at an institutional level, for example libraries, laboratory and computing facilities, and in the department, for example study room, desk, photocopying, secretarial support, etc. Everyone will have their own priorities here. I am always anxious to check the computer support available and regard it as slightly more important than library access. Your working environment and the support available to you plays an essential part in making your work as a postgraduate a positive experience. Life as a postgraduate can be very different to your other experiences of education. Things that can distinguish your experience are the level of study, independence of working, intensity of the course, the demands on your time, and often the fact that you're older than the majority of students. These factors can contribute to making you feel isolated. However, there are several ways you can make sure that this is either short-lived or does not happen at all. Many student unions have postgraduate societies that organize social events and may also provide representation for postgraduates to both the student union and the institution. Departments can also help to create a sense of identity and community and often have discussion groups available. Don't be afraid to talk to staff about any difficulties you might be having. Of course universities provide counselling services, but we have found that the best advice comes from talking to other postgraduates who may have faced similar difficulties. Look at questions 38 to 40. Financial planning is essential since the government excludes postgraduates from student loans and it can be difficult to maintain your student status with banks. This has implications for free banking and overdraft facilities. Do not underestimate your living costs including food, accommodation and travel and be careful not to budget for everything except a social life. Funding a course is one of the most challenging things people face when considering postgraduate study. Most postgraduate students finance themselves. They pay often very large fees to the institution 
and receive no maintenance income to support their study. Make sure you know exactly what your costs will be. Institutions often hide extra fees, like laboratory costs, behind the headline fee rate advertised. Funding can come from various sources – research councils, charities, trust funds, institutional scholarships, local education authorities, and professional bodies and organisations all offer various levels of funding. As I said before, the government excludes postgraduates from student loans, so it is essential you look to other sources. Career development loans are available from high street banks. The best advice on funding is to be proactive, persistent and patient. The postgraduate community in Britain is multinational, has a wide range of experience of life and work and an exciting mix of goals, both career and academic. Being a postgraduate student should be a productive and fulfilling thing to do and you will become part of a diverse and motivated social group. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. They had to run the race. Every move was on the page. But I didn't like their way. Had to fight and misbehave. Had to find a way to change. Had to leave to find my way. Caught up in a daydream. I beat my mind up there almost daily. It's hard.